Okay, now it's time for our question uh, session. And we would like you to come forward with questions. And if you want, if you primarily want an answer from Clemens Kabel, then you go to this microphone over here. And if you primarily want to put a question forward to Professor Craig, then you go to the microphone on the other side. And please introduce yourself by name and then come, with a, come forward with a question. Try to make it short and precise. And then we'll make sure that the answers will be very short and precise also. There will be two minutes for answering for uh, the person that, the, the speaker that the question is put forward to uh, primarily. And then uh, for the other speaker, there will be just one minute to respond to it. So, do we have anyone who wants to put forward a question? Yes, over here. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> My question is regarding the testimonial evidence, uh, and uh, my question is regarding the last testament, which I believe is the Quran, where there is written some scientific uh, verses regarding the expansion of the universe, regarding the uh, development on the, of the embryo, things that we only right now, without development of science, can know. So do you think that the Prophet Muhammad was extremely intelligent, or do we think like Professor Keith L. Moore of embryology in Canada, that he was divinely inspired, or do, did Muhammad have a, had a Hubble telescope or <laughs> a big microscope, or do we see this as some kind of evidence from God? Thank you very much. Can I ask a question in return? Uh, yes. What, what do you think is the best explanation for all the other religious writings of the world? There must be like 10,000 at least claiming different things. What's the explanation that they exist? That's a question to you. <laughs> actually, it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very good question. Actually I, actually, I believe that Jesus, Moses, and all these people, they came with the same, basically, uh, divine message, that there is one God and a moral code, but there were some variations in that times. For example, the prophet Moses came with much more laws. The prophet Jesus came with some kind of variation of these laws. He came, uh, he said to people, focus more on the inner things. But I agree with you that men has a very uh, big interest in changing religion. So I think that people originally had the divine messages, but they changed it to get some kind of, uh, of uh, benefits. So. Yeah, but uh, so now you explain, now you give us what you think is the best explanation why the three uh, Abrahamitic religions have, have the kind of structure content that they have. But that was not the question I asked. I think I'm probably not wrong if I say that there's like 10,000 10, different religions in the world. And if you include those that don't exist anymore but have sort of died out for various reasons, then there's probably more than that. And many of them have either written or oral uh, uh, kind of testimony. And what's the explanation that there is this testimony, that the testimony exists? What's the explanation? I mean, you, you've taken three of them and said that, well, in those three cases, the explanation is divine. But then in the 10,000 minus three other cases, the explanation is not divine. So why is, it this, why is there a divine explanation in these three cases and not the, all, the, all the other cases? The fact that you believe that, does that have something to do with, your, with the place you came from? <laughs> People tend to think that their own religion gives the right answers, but all the others are wrong. <laughs> and w which is kind of strange. I mean, you, you, you get, you get, you get uh, 10,000 testimonial evidences. One of them is your own. And then you conclude, this must be right, the other are wrong. Why okay. not say, well, if there are 10,000 different testimonial evidences, well, then the likelihood that any of them is right is probably very small, and the reason why, that they, why they sort of came up uh, is, is of a different kind. That, yeah. that, that, that's the kind of line I would say. I, I believe we have a lot of questions tonight, so 
Professor Craig, would yeah. you make a comment to this? Very quickly, I studied Islam as part of my theological studies in Munich, and I'm convinced that this attempt to try to find scientific knowledge in the Quran that couldn't have been known at that time is just spurious. Uh, it's not that Muhammad was extremely intelligent, it's that modern Muslims are reading things into the text, reading between the lines that aren't there. For example, this claim about the prediction of modern embryology is simply nonsense. The Quran says something about the embryo being a clot of blood, which is just medically false, but in any case is knowledge that was known or could have been derived from the ancient physician Galen. So I, I think this is really uh, an attempt on the part of Muslim apologists to justify the Quran that doesn't hold scrutiny. Thank you very much. Do we have a question for Professor Craig? Hi, uh, my name is Rasmus. Uh, I have a question for uh, William Lane Craig. Uh, in your philosoph philosophical argument, you said that the universe is contingent and it has an absolute beginning. And you used the Big Bang Theory, uh, not the show, um, the actual scientific theory, to, in order to prove that this is um, irrational for believing that it had a creator and that creator was God. But this is a misinterpretation of the Big Bang Theory because the Big Bang Theory said that there was a primeval state of the universe. And before that, the laws of physics as we know them are not there anymore. So any explanation of what went on before is something we cannot talk about. Uh -huh. And so when you say that the thing that went before the Big Bang must have had an absolute beginning, that's just speculation. And the only two possible options there are is that either it has always existed or it came into existence. Why do you favor it came into existence because of God. Because there is no reason to believe the one assumption over the other. All right, you asked a number of questions. First of all, um, is the universe eternal or did it have a beginning? The scientific evidence is overwhelming and one-sided that the universe did begin to exist and that there was a first physical state which did not have anything prior to it. I, I think you're simply incorrect in your assertion that it doesn't represent an absolute beginning. Look at the bord guth vilenkin theorem, uh, as well as uh, other models in contemporary cosmology. Uh, none of them have been able to be extrapolated to past infinity. They involve a past space-time boundary before which nothing exists. So either there is a transcendent being beyond the universe which brought the universe into being, or else the universe just popped into existence uncaused from absolutely nothing, which as I say, I think is worse than magic. Now, why think that this is a personal being? Well, I, I gave an argument for that. I said that the only things that I'm aware of in my study of metaphysics that could be characterized as transcending time and space, matter and energy being immaterial are either abstract objects like numbers, sets, and other mathematical objects, or else an unembodied mind. Uh, but abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. And we're talking about something that caused the universe to come into existence. So I think we're led to the existence of a beginningless, uncaused, uh, transcendent mind which brought the universe into being. And I would not say this existed before the Big Bang. There is no moment before the Big Bang. The, this thing is causally prior to the Big Bang but it is not temporally prior to the Big Bang. The Big Bang represents the beginning of time and space, as well as matter and energy. So this is a transcendent being that exists beyond time and space. It's beyond the Big Bang, but it's not temporally prior to the Big Bang. Thank you very much. Do you have a comment? Yeah, Just I do. I mean, uh, I think I, I share your sentiments. <laughs> I mean, you, you're now talking about a causal relation between sort of bringing the universe into existence. And the causing agent is just a mind. It's just a mind. And this, but, and I know you, there, there are no physical laws. So this mind causes the universe to exist in the absence of laws, physical laws, and in the absence of time and space. I mean, all causal relations we know of, they occur in time and space. <coughs> So, so it's, it's a, of course, it's a kind of sort of explanation you might propose, but it's, it's, I think everyone who thinks about this, they agree that it's a kind of explanation that raises many more questions than it actually solves. Thank you very much. Next questions over here, please.
Hello, I'm uh, Christian, by name and by faith. Um, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been taught by the both of you, you at the University of Copenhagen, and you through your uh, excellent webpage and your several books, um, and it's a great uh, pleasure to meet you. Um, my question is this. Um, I believe, I think you believe, uh, Klimsk, that there are such a thing as electrons. Right. But why? Why do you believe that there, are, that there are such a thing as electrons? I mean, that's controversial. There are a lot of anti-realists in philosophy of science who think that uh, electrons do not exist or quarks do not exist and so forth. So what are your reasons for believing that they actually exist? Well, the reasons... Basically, it's a kind of testimonial reason. The reason I believe they exist is that this is what the relevant communities in science uh, assert. And the reason they assert it is that it uh, is the best explanation of a vast amount of evidence. It fits into the best explanation. So that's why I think they exist. But then there's another question. What do we mean by existing? Should we have a realist interpretation of the existence of electrons or should we have an anti-realist? where a realist interpretation roughly says that they are out there, they are, particular, they are entities out there independent of our minds and our ways of uh, inquiring in the world. Well, and the anti-realist uh, interpretation of the existence of electrons is different. It says that uh, somehow they don't exist by themselves, they are somehow constructs of our minds or our, our theories, so they are kind of you know, mind-dependent entities. I myself is an, a realist about physical entities. I think they exist really out there. I, I, I don't, I've, I've, I've looked into the sort of <coughs> the kind of arguments for anti-realism proposed by Michael Dahmer and uh, Bas van Frasen, and uh, I'm, I'm not convinced by them. I actually don't think they have a very strong case for anti-realism. The same goes for Kristen Wright. So that's, that's, that's the kind of reasons. And of course you could have the same question regarding God. You could say that God exists, but we should be an anti-realist about God. I don't think that would be your view, no. no. <laughs> so being an anti-realist about God is saying, hey, God exists, I believe that God exists, but psh, by the way, God is just some kind of construction made out of our minds or our language or our ways of inquiry. It's not really out there, it's, it's kind of some kind of social construction as it would be today. I don't think many Christians like that idea, but though, 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 though some do. But the, the view I'm arguing against is not a constructivist notion of God. It's a realist notion of God. The question is helpful because these electrons and other fundamental particles are a nice analog to inference to the best explanation to God. You can't see electrons, you can't touch them, you can't feel them. So why do you believe they really exist, that there are mind-independent entities? Well, it's an inference to the best explanation. By positing the existence of electrons, it enables you to explain a lot of phenomena that we can observe. And it's like that with theism. You can't touch God, you can't see him, you can't feel him, he's a transcendent being. But by postulating this being's existence, it enables you to explain a lot of stuff that otherwise is just inexplicable, like the origin of the universe, the fine tuning of the universe, uh, states of mental awareness and so forth. So I think the question uh, presents a helpful analogy for those of you who are trying to think about inferring to God as uh, the best explanation. Thank you very much. We'll have another question from here. Hello, my name is Andreas. I have a question for you, of course. Um, Dr. Kappel has touched upon the fact that we do not necessarily have to use God as our undetectable creator of everything. We could use the flying spaghetti monster or Russell's teapot or anything. Um, there's this fact, and then there's the fact that the, the resurrection, you used the resurrection of Jesus. Um, that myth is, it's not really unique. Uh, there's been a lot of other creation myths and uh, resurrection myths like that in other religions, and there are thousands of other religions. Now, I, I know I'm probably not gonna convert you in front of 600 people, uh, <laughs> but do, doesn't that make you wonder at least um, perhaps it would if it were accurate, but it's not. <laughs> um, with respect to the flying spaghetti monster, I think I dealt with that in the debate. 
The arguments, if they're successful, give you an immaterial, transcendent reality that exists beyond time and space and that brought all matter and energy into existence. The flying spaghetti monster is made out of a couple of meatballs and a bunch of spaghetti. It's a material entity that cannot exist beyond time and space and therefore cannot be the cause of the universe. So unless we're talking incoherent nonsense, uh, you can see that the type of theism that we get to is going to have very specific properties of this being that will exclude things like uh, the flying spaghetti monster. It, it, it won't get you to Christian theism, these first arguments, but it will get you a sort of monotheism, a, a personal creator and designer of the world who is the ground of absolute goodness. And then my arguments about the historicity of Jesus would get you to Christian theism. Now it's in fact a myth perpetrated on YouTube and the internet that there are ancient myths of dying and rising gods in, in the ancient world. This was uh, a contention of scholars in comparative religion back in the late 1700s, 1800s, that is now almost universally rejected by contemporary scholarships of ancient religion. Look at a book by a Trig Mettinger, who is, I believe, a Swedish scholar who has written a, a major book on dying and rising gods. And he says, people who think that there were pagan myths of dying and rising deities are, are like dinosaurs today. Hardly anybody believes that there were such things. When you look at these supposed parallels, they turn out to be spurious and concocted. And in fact, there's nothing in pagan mythology comparable to uh, Jesus' resurrection. So this is just misinformation that's disseminated in popular media that isn't characteristic of uh, scholarship on, on ancient mythology and, and religion. And uh, Professor Kabel, how do you look at it? <laughs> if well, you look at I it. don't really have a strong view about it, but I think there's an interesting disanalogy in the way that you refer to historical expertise, which you take for granted. But when I refer to philosophical expertise on a number of the questions that you have addressed, then you certainly don't take that for granted. <laughs> so, there are, I mean, you, you can say that among scholars of, of this and that, uh, there's, there's so much agreement that, uh, that uh, these were the historical facts, and you expect us all to take, take your word for it, which is fine, of course, but, um, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm a sort of member of the International Philosophical community, I go to conferences, I have some view about what, what, what are the dominant views, what are the extremely controversial views, and uh, what, what, what's, what's quite certain, what's very uncertain, or regarded as very uncertain. And you don't, I mean, you, you, you don't take these reports quite as seriously as your own reports about historians. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, do we have another question? To Hi, um, my name is Raj. Uh, so my question is regarding your definition of God. Um, so it seems today that a lot of people throw around this red herring of other gods, sort of a smokescreen tactic. Um, whereas if one even looks at, into antiquity, one sees that in fact the people in arts had proposed, for instance, many gods of polytheism and so on, and people in philosophy had refuted these even back into uh, antiquity. Um, so back to your pure definition of God, as opposed to Tor and so on, and Aphrodite and so on. Um, of course, one can easily refute them, as Craig said. With respect to this definition, this very definition, can you, play, can you provide some solid uh, reasons to disbelieve it? Not some doubts, but rather positive reasons why such an entity with, you know, who is uh, transcendent, a mind, and so on, could not exist. Um, I mean, in, and also in light of the ontological argument, you need to show that it doesn't even possibly exist, such a being. Why do I need to show that? Well, I mean, I think the ontological argument powerfully provides reasons to believe that if it even is possible, uh, that such a, you know, from this pure definition, forget the other thousands of gods, and even the Christian God, just take God as you've defined it, that you need to actually show that this isn't even a possibility. Can you show that? Or can you at least provide some positive reasons why such a, vase, uh, such a being cannot, or entity cannot exist? Um, all I've heard is just doubts, so I want to hear some positive reasons. 
Well, I'm not sure you're going to be, going to be satisfied. Uh, one thing, you, I think you asked for two things. Could you give us reasons to think that such a being could not even possibly exist? I don't think I can give such a reason. I think it's a possibility. I mean, the, so reasons that such a being doesn't exist. Well, there are reasons of the same kind as our reasons to think that the uh, Flokistan doesn't exist. Flokistan, you don't know what it is. Well, before modern chemistry was invented, people thought that, um, that, that, well, that you should explain fire and, and certain chemical reactions by postulating a certain entity. But then, at a later stage, it turned out that you can explain these events in, in other ways. Of course, that might all have been wrong. I mean, the Flagstan people might all have been right, and all the other evidence. That's why this doesn't exist. This is also doubt. No. It's, what I said is that the way that science normally operate, and then the way that we, in general, operate, is that um, we operate by inference to best explanations. So what is that exactly? So what's the inference to, a, to an explanation that this doesn't exist as opposed to an inference to a doubt? And that's not even inference, that's just well, saying, oh, it's, I the doubt. Inference, the inference to the best explanation goes as follows. Suppose you have a competing explanations. One is that God exists, one is doesn't entail that God exists. And you think the one that does not entail that God exists is the best, then that's your reason for thinking that God doesn't exist. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, that, that's, a, that's a completely standard. Well, I think it's a mistake for Dr. Koppel to keep comparing God to existent physical or non-existent physical entities like phlogiston or Tor. In these cases where you're talking about physical entities, if they existed, you would see them or you would, you would have empirical evidence of them. And so the fact that uh, you've, you've demonstrated that phlogiston doesn't exist or that Tor doesn't exist, doesn't have any bearing upon a question like whether or not God as classically conceived as a transcendent creator and designer of the universe exists. Um, God would be more like the case of the electrons or perhaps like the case of uh, other universes where if these things existed, um, the, the absence of evidence for them wouldn't necessarily mean they don't exist. Uh, absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. It's only in the case that if the thing did exist that you would expect to have more evidence that you do, that the absence of that evidence would count against the existence of that thing. Thank you very much. I think we have more questions and uh, we should get some of them over here, perhaps. Hi, my name is Justin um, and I would like to build off uh, the first question that was on this side. Um, and it was about the, uh, starting with the, the Big Bang, I yes. think, I think the, the uh, this is the build-up, uh, that the uh, idea that he was presenting that is uh, we are uncertain about before then, and I bring this up um, to address the first point of the philosophical argument of that the, um, the universe that we know, that we experience, I believe, uh, I believe the word you used was contingent, Yes, um, that was a separate argument from the origin right, of the universe right, right. argument. And that, so we have a, a universe that we know that is contingent. And then we have this idea, this being uh, that we are calling God that is, is not contingent, that is an inherent. And um, for, in, in what way can we uh, uh, suggest that the, it's more reasonable that this, uh, this uh, being that we don't know, the God, is more inherent than the universe that we know. Why, can we, why are we assuming ah. that the universe is contingent and okay. this being is not contingent? All right, now this is a good question. What he's saying is, okay, let's grant that every contingent entity has an explanation of its existence. Why think that the universe is a contingent entity? Maybe the universe exists metaphysically necessarily. And that would concern the third premise of my argument. And as I said in my opening speech, I'm not aware of any philosopher, contemporary philosopher or physicist, who thinks that the universe exists metaphysically necessarily, that it's not contingent. Now, why is that? Well, because it's very easy to conceive of a possible world in which a different collection of fundamental particles or fundamental fields exist. 
And if that were the case, then a different universe would exist. Uh, consider by way of analogy, your shoes, say they're made of, of leather. Uh, could your shoes, those very shoes, have been made of steel? Now notice I'm not asking could you have had a steel pair of shoes that was the same shape and size as these. Rather, could those shoes have been made of steel? And I think we would say no. If, if they were made of steel, it would be a different pair of shoes. It wouldn't be the same. Similarly with the universe. If the universe were composed of a different collection of quarks or fields, it would be a different universe. It wouldn't be the same. And that su suggests or shows, I think, the universe is contingent in its existence. It would be fantastic to think that every single fundamental quark and particle in the universe exists as a metaphysically necessary being. Uh, and scientists continually deal with universes that would be governed by different laws of nature. So it seems to me very, very plausible that the universe is contingent in its existence uh, and is not a metaphysically necessary being. So for that reason, I think the third premise is secure. Do you have any comments? So I take this to entail that uh, God could have decided not to create the universe. You're asking me? Could, am I saying that God could have not created? I'm asking, does it, I, oh, or you're asking the student? No, or? no, I'm asking you. If, I suppose the, your view then that the, the, the universe exists contingently. Yes. I suppose that on your view, God doesn't exist contingently. Correct. But given that the universe exists contingently, that God could have decided not to create the universe. Correct. Okay. No, it's, it, it was not an objection. I was just curious. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I have another question over here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Preysen. In, in the course of debate, you say that we cannot prove that God exists or God doesn't exist. But I believe Bill have attempt to prove God exists. And you, in the end, says, I have not presented any argument that God doesn't exist. So how can I be a reasonable atheist? Well, well um, when I said that you can't prove that God exists and you can't prove that God doesn't exist, what I meant was proof in the logical, philosophical sense where proof means that you have a set of premises and then it deductively follows, and then a certain conclusion deductively follows from that. I don't think there's a reasonable set of premises which is sort of reasonably compelling to everyone such that the conclusion that God exists follows. And I don't think there's a set of premises such that the conclusion that God doesn't exist follows. Um, so, but what I said is that the way, of, the way to be a reasonable atheist is to treat the hypothesis that God exists as a hypothesis about how the world is. To treat it that way. And if we treat it that way and subject it to the sort of usual standards of thinking about what there might be in the world, then I don't think it's a very uh, compelling hypothesis. I, think, I don't think we have very compelling to reason to say that apart from the, in addition to the world as we know, all the properties that we know, then there's also this very, very strange and completely different entity. I don't think the reasons are very compelling. It's, it's, it's right that, that, that Quake has, has, has said that there are, so there are reasons of this sort. He said there are reasons of this sort. I don't think they are compelling. He keeps saying they are compelling. I keep being very unconvinced that they are compelling. And I sort of suggest why, and he then says, well, they are compelling. So you have his word for them being very compelling, and you have my word for them being not very compelling. <laughs> now, I don't think I've ever used the word compelling tonight. I, I didn't say that atheists are irrational. No, I just no, think I that there that. are good arguments for theism that meet the desiderata of yeah. Dr. Okay. But you keep saying they're good arguments. I keep saying they're not good arguments. Oh. Yes, of course you don't, but then you need to show why. You need to identify yeah. which premise is and false have, and, I have, and I have, why. I have, I have in, a, in, a, in a general sense, I've, I've, I've pointed to some of the premises and about the other premises I've said, well, take my word for it, these premises are quite controversial in, in the philosophical community. Yeah, now we're, we're not going to, to take your word for it. 
Now, I hear this. I'm uh, supposed to get a chance here now, right, yeah, to yeah. respond. So let, let me respond to the question. Um, Dr. Koppel, as we said, says that in order to provide evidence for a position, you can either give philosophical arguments, inference to the best explanation, or testimonial evidence. And so what we want to ask is, why should we believe atheism is true? What justification of any of those sorts is there for atheism? And we just haven't heard it. We're, we're looking for how can I be a reasonable atheist? What, what grounds or justification is there for it? Now, I agree, we can treat God exists as a hypothesis about the world, and my burden has been to show that the God hypothesis is very rich in explanatory power. Uh, it explains a wide range of the data of human experience, moral values, consciousness, uh, the origin of the universe, why something exists rather than nothing, the fine-tuning <coughs> of the universe, the historical facts about Jesus of Nazareth. This is an explanatory hypothesis that covers a wide range of the data of human experience, and therefore it seems to me to be perfectly rational to hold to. Thank you very much. We have another question for Professor Craig. Dr. Craig, my name is Nissan. Uh, in the cosmological argument and also the argument from the um, beginning of the universe that you brought forward, uh, they depend on the proposition that abstract entities like numbers cannot stand in causal or explanatory relations to physical events. Uh, but what would you say to the proposition that the um, abstract laws of arithmetic can stand in explanatory and causal relationship to the physical workings of a pocket calculator multiplying two of, numbers? Of what? A pocket calculator multiplying two numbers. All right. Um. The laws of nature, if they exist, would be propositions or mathematical equations of a certain form, and therefore would be abstract objects that exist beyond time and space. And they have no causal connection with anything. So the laws of nature are simply propositional descriptions of the way things in the universe operate, like, say, a pocket calculator. But the laws of nature don't cause the pocket calculator to work in a certain way. They're, it's simply misconceived to think that there's a causal relationship between these abstract propositional objects and physical things in the world. So I would say the laws of nature do not cause things to happen. They simply are accurate descriptions of the way the things in the universe uh, act and react in causal relations amongst themselves. They have certain causal powers and dispositions, and the laws of nature are just true descriptions of this. But the laws of nature don't cause anything. They're just abstractions, and, and as such, don't have any causal power. Okay. Do you have any well, I think I agree about your skepticism about whether laws of nature conceived as, as propositions or mathematical equations don't have causal relations, don't stand in causal relations. Um, I agree about that, but um, I sort of keep wondering, why is it that you think, oh, I'm sorry, I'm now sort of again asking a, a question to you. <laughs> so one, one, one thing I've, I, I don't think I even begin to understand is how is it that a bodily mind, sorry, that a bodyless mind causes the universe to exist? I mean, what's, what's the kind of causal relation? What's, what's the mechanics of that? I mean, try to imagine it. You have a mind, no body around. And then this mind, by a, an act of will, causes the... And this is the explanation. And we are now told that this is a better explanation than saying it just happens randomly. Why is it better? It seems to explain the mysterious by something which is vastly more mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting question, so I'll make an exception here and give oh. you another minute to explain that. I think that God's actions in the world are the analog to what we call basic actions that we do in our own bodies. When I will to lift my arm, I have a conscious volition and I will to lift my arm. Uh, and God's actions in the world would be like the basic actions which a mind uh, produces in its body. Um, so that's why I think 
Moreland's book on consciousness and the existence of God is so helpful because as a substance dualist, he believes that minds are mental or spiritual substances that are endowed with causal powers. And to ask what is the mechanics or the linkage between the two is to deny precisely this idea of a basic action. It, it's to look for some kind of a physical linkage, which isn't there. That is to assume the wrong sort of model for uh, mental causation. And notice if you deny this type of causation, then what that means is we have no freedom of the will, we have no causal effects in our bodies from our minds or volitions. Uh, causation would be an entirely one-way street, uh, and I think that that's not a plausible model of human persons. Thank you. you put a question? My name is Leif Asmark Jensen. Um, I was a little surprised uh, when you suddenly in the debates uh, start questioning it, is this debate at all important? I've never been to a debate where some of the debaters start questioning if a topic is important or not. Uh, <laughs> so I actually have a question. Uh, can you give like, some examples of what you consider important in your life and then give us a reason why is that important at all? Well, I think uh, here's some important questions. Um, should we do more to relieve suffering in the third world? Should we, how, in, in what way can our lives be said to be meaningful, to have a meaning? Uh, in what way is uh, morality binding? Why should we be moral beings? These are important questions. Of course, you might then say, well, the question of God links to all these questions. But actually, that's, <coughs> that, that's one of the things I find really puzzling. I mean, hearing this explanation about how the world came about, why exactly does it show that morality is binding? That you ought to be a moral person? I mean, you hear this story about how the universe was created six billion years ago by a bodiless mind that created an act of will. Why does that show that you ought to be a moral being? There's a large number of steps missing here. As we all, maybe, maybe you have, a, have, an, have an explanation, but you know, I mean, I, I think that the question of why we ought to be moral beings is, is a very, very important one and has been discussed immensely in philosophy. Most philosophers who have discussed that question since Kant and before that have not resorted to the traditional view of saying that we ought to be moral beings because God has laid down the moral rules and he'll punish us if we are not moral beings. That's that's tradi one traditional answer, of course, but it's, it's, it's an answer which uh, most philosophers have, have have not accepted, though of course some have, so it's a matter of contra mm. controversy. But these are important questions, yeah. yeah. So, the, uh, so why do you think they're important? Why do you think it's important to minimize suffering in the third world? Why do you think it's important to have moral issues? Why? Uh, well, now you're sort of imputing things I didn't say. I, I, I said it's an important question whether we should do it. Mm. Big question, you know, don't you think so? I mean, <laughs> don't you think that's an important question? I'm asking, I'm asking you, you. I think it's important because, um, well, I think human suffering and human happiness is important. If you're asking, so if you're asking me to give a kind of presuppositionless argument that terminates in the conclusion that human suffering is important, then I think that, that's actually pretty difficult. So I'm very convinced that human suffering is important, but it's hard to come up with a non-question begging argument that human suffering is important. And now you're smiling because now I need God yeah. No, I don't think so. I think this is a genuine philosophical issue that we ought to think about. And when we think about it seriously, then, I mean, I, I, I don't find myself consoled by trying to address that very important problem by simply saying there's this, there's this very obscure being that is explaining all this. Thank you. you have it. Anybody who doesn't think that the question of the existence of God is important, I think needs to take a heavy dose of French existentialist philosophy. Read the atheist French philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, who thought that in the absence of God, life is absurd, without meaning, value, or purpose. I have never read a more poignant description of the human predicament than in the writings of authors like these. Or Friedrich Nietzsche, the 19th century atheist who proclaimed the death of God 
uh, and uh, predicted an, an, the advent of nihilism once this realization was uh, widespread. I think these authors provide a very, very uh, gripping analysis of the human predicament in the absence of God, and therefore it's just absolutely vital that each of us think hard about this question because every day we wake up, we answer by how we live, whether or not we think objective moral values exist, there's meaning in life, there's purpose to my existence and so forth. These questions are unavoidable. Thank you. And do we have another question over here? Yes. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I'm Morten. And um, yes, you just said that um, the question of uh, whether God exists is an important yeah, one. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, and an essential one. And I fail to see that. So. Could I need you, you to enunciate a little more clearly. Okay, so I fail to see why is the question whether God exists an important or essential question. Could you give a dumbed-down version of uh, why is that? Yeah, yes. Uh, why is it important? Well, because let's, let's assume that the God of Christian theism exists. That means that there is a creator of the universe who loves you, who is absolute goodness and who wants to bring you into a relationship with himself forever, an inexhaustible, incommensurable good. It would be the fulfillment of human existence. It means there's a purpose for which you were created. God has a purpose for you to fulfill in this life. And it means that human beings are intrinsically morally valuable and that you have moral obligations to fulfill, such as loving your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and. Uh, helping to alleviate human suffering. Um, so there are profound implications if this is true. Now on the other hand, if atheism is true, then it's very hard to see why there's any purpose in life. On atheism, the universe is destined to extinction in the heat death of the universe. As the universe expands, all the stars and the galaxies will burn out and matter will degenerate into black holes and dead stars. There will be no light, there will be no life, there will be no heat, only the corpses of dead stars and galaxies expanding into the endless night. It will be a universe in ruins. There is no purpose for which the universe exists, no purpose for which you exist. Moreover, there's no meaning to your life, ultimately. It doesn't matter what you do, because whatever you do will all end up the same in extinction. And it's hard to see on naturalism why there would be any objective moral values, why people would have intrinsic value. We're just basically relatively advanced primates which have evolved on this speck of solar dust called planet Earth. And it's hard to see why you would have an obligation to love other primates of your species or to do them good or not to act in your self-interest in certain cases. So these lead to just radically different views of how you will live your life depending on whether or not God exists. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, can I make a comment? Yes, you can. It's fine with you. Okay, you can, you can make okay. a short comment. Thank you. Yes. Um, your argument is you're appealing to uh, feelings, right? No. You, no, you, uh, goodness well, sake. Okay, okay, can I, can I continue? Uh, how, is, uh, how is talking about the heat death mm, of the mm, universe mm. and the it's, extinction it's, of the human race <laughs> Uh, so I, I appeal to feelings. That's a scientific fact about how things are going to end up. I, that's, I believe that. Um, what I meant was that I fail to follow your argument because I don't... I think that I should feel a void inside me if God doesn't, doesn't exist. You, you should what? Feel a void inside of me. Well, feel. now that's an appeal to feelings. You're the one appealing to feelings, mm -hmm. not me. I'm... You, you yes, should yes. feel a void okay, I, and you I'm, don't. I'm, sorry? You, you say you should feel a void and you apparently don't. I, I don't because, well, yeah. what if there's nobody loving me? Well, most of the time I love me and if I don't then my family does and my friends. So I don't see the necessity for God through that. Uh, I, I would, well, uh, I should feel that there's a need for God. That, and that I, it seems to be your argument. I don't know. I mean, Nietzsche can said I? that people may not feel the need for God because they can render themselves oblivious to this. Pascal said the same thing. By occupying ourselves 
with activities and entertainment, we don't think of the, the absurdity of life and the meaninglessness that surrounds us. I, I think it takes serious philosophical reflection on these matters to, to realize them, and the mass of humanity uh, often don't pause to seriously think about the implications if there is no God or if there is a God. But they're, they're vastly different, as I think I illustrated. And so whether you feel a void or not is more a matter of your personal psychology than whether or not these worldviews have drastically different implications for human beings. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, comment. Uh, no, I'd like to comment on it. I mean, so the question is why is the, why is the question whether God exists important at all? And one view that explains why it's important is if you think that the existence of God explains that there's a meaning to life, that morality exists, objective morality exists, you really ought to be moral, that there's an afterlife and all that. So if you assume a, a number of things about God, then that will also explain why the question about God is, is important. That's fine. But then in, in, in your comments, uh, uh, Craig, you, you also said that uh, if you that it also goes the other way, that if you, if you don't assume that God exists, then you can't explain meaning of life. You can't explain morality. And, and, so, and, and the whole <coughs> thing becomes a kind of sort of existentialist nightmare. I don't agree about that at all. I mean, there's, there's a long-standing project in philosophy to explain morality, for one thing. Oh, that, that's that's pro probably the primary thing that people have been pre preoccupied with. Explaining morality without appealing to God. Kant, for example, was a firm believer in God, but he had this very interesting project of explaining morality without appealing to God. And, uh, you know, uh, this is controversial whether Kant succeeds in this, but, it, but, but it's, it's just one of many, many projects. And the, 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 the sort of brisk idea that without God we can't explain these things, that's just not true. I mean, it's, it's, it's up in the air. Thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah, my name is Peter. I'm from Copenhagen, from Kirken Kulturcenter. And Mr. Kapla, I have a question for you. Um, you have consistently this night uh, put Christianity in the same bracket as the ten thousands of other religions, even uh, the Nordic ones with Thor and the other crazy party gods. So my question to you is now that, uh, that we have been talking about the Jews actually seriously discussing with each other all of these supernatural events that occurred at Jesus' time like the resurrections and the miracles and all of these things. Um, and if you look at the historical evidence for these discussions, it's pretty vast. And uh, if we were to disregard them as pure gibberish, we would in the same breathing also have to discard events like Caesar because it is actually like Caesar. Um, if you use the same methods disregarding these uh, discussions, we would also have to disregard Caesar because it's so well documented. So now that we know this, my question to you is, do you then believe that this actually deserves to be um, regarded as a good argument for putting Christianity in another bracket than all of the other 10,000s of religions? Um, and if you don't, would you please elaborate why? Um, I don't deny uh, that Jesus existed. I as far as I'm told, I'm, I'm not an expert in this at all, uh, but uh, as, far as, I'm, as far as I'm told, there's solid historical evidence that Jesus existed. But the evidence that he was God's son is less solid. I mean, he claimed so, other people claimed so, but you know, solid evidence for this was, was less solid. And um, <laughs> that's the chill line I would take. I mean, it's, uh, there were certain supernatural phenomena being reported. Well, the pr the reports are there, no doubt. Were they true? Is the best explanation of these reports, the occurrence of these reports, is the best explanation that, that this actually happened, or is there some other explanation? Uh, we are getting close to an end, but it's a very short yeah, okay, one. But, but, okay, let, let, let me come, uh, compare to Caesar. I don't question at all that Caesar existed, but suppose that there was a, a sort of reported supernatural event about Caesar. I would be a bit skeptical about whether that actually happened. Well, the thing is that now it's actually the Jews who are the most eager people to prove that Jesus was an imposter and a fraud. Uh, a fraud. And since these people who are actually so eager to, to prove him yeah, wrong, they were discussing the supernatural things as if they actually happened. 
that is when it becomes peculiar. And that's why I'm asking, do you then think that Christianity deserves to be put in another bracket than all of the other religions? And if not, could you elaborate? I think the basic reason why Christianity evolved and, uh, and gained such a great following, there the are naturalistic sociological explanations of why this happened. That's what I think, yeah. But if, of course, do, do you want me to sort of elaborate the precise sociological historical explanations of why this religion or this person with these followers gained such a prominence rather than all the many other people who were around in that area at that time? Why, 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 didn't, why didn't they sort of get a great crowd? I don't know the details of that, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that there is a naturalistic explanation of why that happened. Okay, thank you. And you um, I guess I would just simply say that Christianity is, I think, set apart from most of the other religions of the world and that it's not just a code of ethics or a, a, a system of religion about various gods and deities, but it's a religion that is rooted in history, in real historical events and people and places that you can read about in other ancient historical texts and that we have archaeological confirmation of. You can read about people like Pontius Pilate, John the Baptist, James, Jesus' younger brother, in the works of Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian. We have archaeological evidences for the places described in the New Testament. This is not some sort of myth about a fairy land. This is about real people that actually lived, real places that actually existed, real events that actually took place. And as I say, that includes those three facts that crucially undergird the inference to Jesus' resurrection. So I think this does help to set Christianity apart. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank both of you for this very interesting debate. And also I want to thank you for all your wonderful questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.